Okay. Om Madhyan Timarandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sanyavadi Paschachate Satarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebio Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare We're studying Nectar of Devotion and we're on chapter 3, eligibility of the candidate for accepting devotional service. So Rupa Goswami had described that actually the, the qualification for accepting devotional service is simply that one has a desire to engage in devotional service. We heard about four different kinds of people who come to Krishna consciousness as described in the Bhagavad Gita. Namely, the one in distress, the one in search of wealth, the one in uh, search of knowledge, and the one who's curious. And we heard that the, of these four, the best one is the one who comes in search of knowledge. And then Rupa Goswami is describing that the pure devotee does not worry about li liberation. So, Rupa Goswami is now giving evidence to support these statements with quoting different verses from the scriptures. So, you, you can continue reading, Tatyana? Mm. 
Концов славы и не хотят ни освобождения, ни материального счастья в любой форме. Я все же предоставляю место среди своих спутников в моей высшей обители. So this verse is stated from the 25th chapter of the third canto, which is a very famous verse. Srila Prabhupada lectured on these verses, and it's there in the book called The Teachings of Lord Kapila. So Lord Kapila is speaking to his mother Devahuti and he's describing to her how the devotees have loving relationships with the Lord. And he's talking about how the pure devotees see the Lord in the deity form. We, we should also develop a taste for seeing the Lord in the deity form. The, seeing the beauty of the Lord in the deity and developing the relationship with the Lord. But Lord, Lord Kapila describes how the devotees who, have, who are taking pleasure in their relationship with the Lord, they have no desire for liberation. They don't want any kind of material happiness. They don't want to ask the Lord for anything. But the Lord brings them back to His association in the spiritual world. So, although the devotee is very happy to serve the Lord wherever they are, the Lord sometimes likes to bring the devotees back to his abode. This, so this verse shows the, the loving relationship between the Lord and his devotees. So Srila Prabhupada goes on to discuss this more in the next paragraph. Tatyana will read. For the impersonalist, liberation is their goal. They simply want to get free from the material world. So for the impersonalist, their, their liberation is called, it's known as Sayuja Mukti, which means merging into the oneness of the Brahman. And that, that same destination 
of being in the Brahman, that is also given to the demons who Krishna kills. And so we can understand that the destination of the impersonal is, is not really ideal, it's not the perfect situation. And even they, they may achieve that liberation, if they do achieve it, they cannot stay there for long. because there, there are no activities there. So they will come back again to the material world. So Rupa Goswami, in describing the glories of devotional service, he also minimizes the position of impersonal liberation. So he describes how the devotee's attachment is to doing service to the Lord rather than just simply thinking of their own liberation. The devotee just simply wants to be engaged in devotional service. And they have a strong attraction to see the beauty of the Lord and His different bodily features. Seeing, seeing the beauty of the Lord from His lotus feet to, through the different limbs of His body is the perfection of the eyes. The gopis, the gopis curse Lord Brahma. They consider Lord Brahma to be a, a, a hopeless creator. Be Lord Brahma is condemned by the gopis because they said he gave us eyes which blink. Our eyes keep blinking, we're not able to properly look at Krishna without blinking. We want to see Krishna at every moment, but these eyes are blinking. So this Brahma did a terrible job in creation. Terrible job? Yeah, he did not do a good job. We're also told that if we look on the form of Govinda and we see the beauty of the Lord, then we'll never be attracted again to the family, society and friends. So in this way we want to appreciate the beauty of the form of the Lord. Go
So now another verse is being quoted, this time spoken by Uddhava, who is directly addressing Lord Krishna. So Uddhava is a very intimate friend of Lord Krishna and he's like the, the secretary of Lord Krishna. When Krishna was in Dwarka, then Uddhava was often with him. Uddhava was also, there was some relationship there that Uddhava was like a nephew of Lord Krishna. And Uddhava had bodily features also very similar to Krishna. And he would wear the garland of Lord Krishna and he would often wear clothes or cloth which had been worn by Krishna. Hmm. So Uddhava is saying that devotional service is so, is, gives so much satisfaction that there's no, happy, there's no appreciation for the activities of the material world which come in the form of religion, economic development, sense gratification and liberation. Yeah. In material life, these four activities are very much important and that's the basis of material existence. And the Vedas encourage the, these four activities very much. The Vedic literature speak a lot about activities which are based on religion, economic development, sense gratification and liberation. So in material life, happiness is generally de derived from these four activities. But Uddhava said he doesn't, he, he doesn't think about it, he doesn't have an interest in the happiness from these activities. He could easily get happiness, he could easily have economic development, sense gratification, liber liberation, he could, all of these things are there for him any time. But he, he doesn't want them. All he wants is faith and devotion in the service of Krishna. So this is the thinking of the pure devotee, the advanced devotee, they think like that. Go ahead.
Okay. So again, this is again another verse from this 25th chapter of the third canto where Lord Kapila is instructing his mother. So Lord Kapila describes the mood of the devotee. They're, they're only thinking about service, to God, what service they can do for the Lord. And they're willing to do anything without consideration for the pleasure of the Lord. And they take, they're very active in hearing and coming together with other devotees to discuss the Lord and His pastimes and glorify the Lord. So to that, to such devotees, they have no interest at all in the thought of becoming one with the Lord or achieving that impersonal liberation. But then Lord Kapila goes on, he said, they don't even want the other kinds of liberation. They, 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 they don't want the impersonal liberation, but they don't want the other kinds of liberation either. Yeah, they may, the Lord may offer them opulences like the Lord. Or, or he may offer the devotee to become one of his personal associates and live with him on the, in, the, in the spiritual world, in the Vaikuntha. Or they may give the, the devotee a body similar to the Lord, like the residents in Vaikuntha, they all have forearm forms like the Lord. In Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Sanatana Goswami describes how Gopkumar, a cowherd boy from Vrindavan, went to Vaikuntha. So when Gop Kumar entered into Vaikuntha, he saw people with forearm forms and one after another he thought they were the Lord and he was offering obeisances to them. But they would say, they would say, no, 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 I'm not the Lord, I am a servant. But they had a forearm form and they looked just like the Lord himself. So they had achieved sarupya mukti, they had achieved liberation where they were given a bodily feature just like the Lord. Of course there are subtle differences between their body and the body of the Lord. that the Lord has a special mark on his chest, the Srivatsa hair on his chest, which distinguishes him from other devotees.
and he also wears the kastupa gem around his neck. So that uh, Gopkumar learned how to recognize who is actually the Supreme Lord. But here, Lord Kapila Dev is saying that the pure devotees, that they're not interested in having this kind of liberation. All they want is devotional service. They're so satisfied, they're getting so much happiness from devotional service, they don't want anything else. Go ahead. So now we have a verse from the fourth canto by Shrim, uh, Dhruva Maharaj and he's speaking to the Lord because Dhruva Maharaj had done great austerities in the forest for six months and then the Lord appeared to him. So Dhruva Maharaj was a young child at the time, but the Lord touched him on the head with his conch shell and inspired him with transcendental knowledge. And after touching on the head, Dhruva Maharaj was inspired to offer these prayers to the Supreme Lord. So he's describing how the devotees enjoy far greater pleasure than the pleasure of the impersonalists. So the impersonalists, they get, they, they achieve some degree of self-realization. They understand themselves as Brahman. But they have no realization of the Supreme Lord. So their, their real, realization is limited simply to understanding I'm not the body. So on that level of liberation, they're no longer subject to any miseries of the material body. They don't suffer any miseries due to the material body. Miseries of the material world, adibotic, adiatmic, adidaivic, these three different kinds of miseries are there in the material world. Miseries of the body, miseries of the mind, miseries of material nature, and miseries from other 
living entities. But the impersonalist, he doesn't experience this because he's liberated, he's freed from the bodily connect connection. But he doesn't experience spiritual bliss. No material suffering, but no spiritual bliss. So Dhruva Maharaj said, the devotees who are doing devotional service, who are meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord, they experience that bliss. Dhruva Maharaj. And then there are ordinary karmis, people who work to enjoy the results of their labor. They, they want to go to the higher planet. So you, you can understand, they cannot experience much happiness, they cannot get much happiness. The happiness of the heavenly planets is insignificant compared to the happiness of the devotee. The happiness of the heavenly planets is even inferior to the happiness of the impersonalist. But the devotee who is properly engaged in Krishna's service, he can experience that happiness. Okay, so now we've completed the third chapter, we're going to go on to chapter 4. It's entitled, Devotional Service Surpasses All Liberation. Go ahead. So Prithu Maharaj is one of the incarnations of the Lord and he's described, his activities are described in the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Prithu Maharaj was, his, his body was actually created from the but well, what happened, there was a demonic king called Venu and Venu was, he was very cruel and he created a lot of turmoil in the, on the world and so the brahmanas cursed him to die.
So, after Vinu was cursed to, by the brahmanas to death, then the brahmanas wanted somebody to become the king and to rule. So from the dead body of Venu, they produced the body of Maharaj Prithu. So Maharaj Prithu performed many uh, wonderful activities and he would perform many different sacrifices and please the Lord. Srimad Bhagavatam describes how Maharaj Prithu would do yagya and the four Kumaras would come. They would become present, they would actually come and attend the sacrifice. So because he was so powerful and pure, he could attract pure devotees like the four Kumaras to come. So here in the verse which is quoted, Prithu Maharaj is glorifying the importance of hearing and chanting. that the pure devotees, they have a, a very strong taste to hear about Krishna and to chant the glories of Lord Krishna. And Prithu Maharaj prays, that he would, he would like to have millions of tongues and millions of ears so that he could go, do more chanting and more hearing. Pure devotees, they just simply want that opportunity to hear and chant. They don't want anything else. They're so they're getting so much pleasure in that that they don't aspire for anything else. They think what is one tongue is not enough. Can't do much with one tongue. And one pair of ears is not enough. I need many, many years, many, many tongues, then I can chant better. So this is the thinking of the pure devotee. Go ahead. So the impersonalists, of course, for them we said their goal is the Sayuja Mukti, to merge, to enter into the oneness of the Brahman. So entering into the Brahman, the, 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 the impersonalist has the idea that they're no longer an individual, that they've just become one with the oneness of the Brahman. And 
And in that condition, there's no activity, there's no relationship, there's no variety, there's only the oneness. So, this is why in that condition, the impersonalists, they cannot do any hearing, they cannot chant, they cannot appreciate the glories of the Lord. And they cannot appreciate how the Lord's form is not material. They're thinking when Krishna comes in this world that he is also like them. They're thinking that Krishna has come from the Brahman. So he's come and they think he has come in the form of pure goodness, in the form of goodness. So they, so they cannot understand how the Lord's form is not material. They're thinking he's also taken birth. Just as we have taken birth, they think the, when Krishna comes, he is also taken birth. So they don't have any any appreciation to hear and chant about Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada says that one has to be over, one has to be on the liberated platform to take pleasure in chanting and hearing about Krishna. So our, de our devotional service begins on that platform of liberation. This is described in the Bhagavad Gita, right? 18th chapter, Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Nasochati Nakanchati Samasarveshu Bhuteshu Madbhaktim Labhate Param that one who is, on the, who is actually underst understood that they're Brahman, that they're not the body, then they are, they are a joyful soul. They don't hanker or lament for anything. And they see all living entities equally. This is actually the platform of Brahman. This is the liberated platform. So in that condition one can take up devotional service. And one, in that condition, because one is on the transcendental platform, then he can appreciate also the transcendental nature of the form of the Supreme Lord. The, fo the form of the Lord. So we see how Krishna consciousness works, how it brings us very quickly to the liberated platform. It doesn't need to take any time. Very easily, very quickly, 
devotee can come up to that platform of Brahman and begin devotional service. We just simply have to engage in, in the devotional service. Okay, we'll go one more pair. So, in the fifth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, we hear about Bharat Maharaj. He was the eldest son of Rishabdev. Rishabdev had 100 sons, and he was the, the most famous of them. And after his father retired to do austerity, then Bharat became the king. But as a king, he was not so much attached. He didn't. He didn't take much. Any much. He didn't enjoy much. He didn't take a lot of pleasure in being the king, or in having the opulence of the king, and his family. And he was so much attracted to serving the supreme lord. Even though he was given so much opulence by the goddess of fortune, he didn't take pleasure in it. And he gave it all up. He renounced everything to go to the Himalayas and to do austerity and pursue the goal of life. So this behavior of Maharaj Bharat was appreciated by Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami, he's also a renunciate. So one renunciate will appreciate the renunciation of another person. The behavior of Maharaj Bharat would be criticized by the materialists. They would, they would say, oh, very irresponsible, not good, it's very bad to give up the family, to leave the home, this is not good. But, for somebody like Sukadeva Goswami, Sukadeva Goswami said, yes, very good. He said, it's natural because somebody who has a taste for devotional service, they, they have no taste for material life. Material opulences 
That does not mean anything, it doesn't attract the mind of the pure devotee. The happiness of the material world is insignificant compared to the pleasure which is there on the spiritual platform. So Srila Rupa Goswami has compiled this nectar of devotion, giving so much evidence to support the thinking or the activities of the devotees. The, the, the nature of the devotee is to want to appreciate the, the, the scriptures and to hear the information from the scriptures. For the, for the non-devotee, for the materialists, they're fully in the mode of passion and ignorance. They have no taste, they have no interest to hear about the great devotees and the great saintly kings. They're still attracted by the glitter of the, the, the material world. The material world appears attractive to the minds of the materialists. So in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna compares the two people. He said, one is like in what is daytime for one is night for the other, and what is night for the other is daytime for that. Very, very different visions and different tastes. Okay, so we will stop here and we'll ask if there's any questions. The result does the result. Well, uh, yes, raising a child is devotional service. It's certainly important to raise the children in such a manner that they can become devotees. Uh, 
Srila Prabhupada describes about his own childhood and how much his parents encouraged him in Krishna consciousness. The example of his father worshipping the deities. So being a parent is a big responsibility because all of our actions and activities are seen by our child. So it's very important that somebody who has a child that they show the right behavior and the right example to, to inst instruct the child by their behavior. Just like the child needs to see the parents also chanting, he needs to see the mother and father that what they, when they cook food they first of all offer it to Krishna and they will bow down before Krishna's altar. The child needs to see these things. And the child needs to see these things from the beginning of their life. Then it becomes very easy for the child to accept Krishna consciousness. But if, if the child doesn't see the mother or father do these things, then the child will also not be much inspired to be a devotee. Now, how, how did I become a devotee? I didn't see my mother and father bow down. I didn't see my mother and father do any of these things. How, how was I able to come to Krishna consciousness? Certainly, I didn't, become, I didn't take up Krishna consciousness from the beginning of life. But I had to experience the frustration of material life and the frustration of material life inspired me to Krishna consciousness. Because I was looking and searching, trying to find some, the answers to the problems of life. And, and I, find, I found all the answers, I got all the information from Krishna Consciousness. So that, that frust frustration and, and lack of satisfaction in material life, that brought me to Krishna Consciousness. But it's much better if from the very beginning of life one can become Krishna conscious. So if the parent, if you, as a mother, if you're able to inspire your child to show the nice example to them, then it can make it so much easier for the child to take up Krishna consciousness. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it said, don't become a parent unless you can deliver your children from
from birth and death. So it, it's a responsibility to be a mother, to be a father, it's a responsibility to bring up a child. And the responsibility is to, to show them the right example and to try to attract, get them to develop some appreciation for Krishna consciousness. Being a parent, parenting is a very, very big subject matter and uh, gradually our movement is bringing out some literature uh, discussing the importance of parenting and how we should be parents, how, what kind of things we should do in order to encourage the children. So, if, if we are regularly chanting the holy name and doing kirtan, then naturally the child will also become attracted and take up these activities. I don't know if, if I've answered. No. I, I don't know if I've answered your question sufficiently. But is there something, per, per, some other particular aspect of parenting you wanted to ask about? Yes, um, you, you need to try to make your home Krishna conscious. Yeah. If, if you are showing the example, if you chant the, na the holy name of the Lord, if you are doing devotion, if the child sees you worshipping, then the child will follow you. Now some people have told me, they said, bringing up children to be devotees is the most difficult thing. They found it very, very difficult to make their, to bring their children to Krishna consciousness. Well, certainly it's difficult if you have not, if you were not a devotee in the beginning. So you already had the child and then later on, after having the child, then you become a devotee. So it means the child, they don't see you, they don't see from the beginning of their life, they don't see Krishna consciousness.
Just like sometimes the parents, they become devotees and then they want to become vegetarian, but they have a child who said, no, no, I want to eat meat, I don't want to just eat vegetables. But if the child from the beginning of life is brought up as a vegetarian, then it's, that's not a problem. So, so, so it's difficult to give children something new somewhere along the line to suddenly change their life. It's difficult. But still, you have to try. It's your duty as a parent. Now, Prabhupada had children. He had three sons and two daughters. And he tried also. He brought his children to temple and so on. But, you know, the, well, they were not so much interested. The youngest son is a pious man, a good man, but other sons, we don't even know about them. So it's, it's difficult, but you have to try to bring your children up to be a devotee. It doesn't depend on their astrology. Don't worry about what the chart says. Devotional service is transcendental. Astrology is material. Okay. Is there... Some other question? Well, good training in Krishna consciousness would help. For some people, it's very nice if you can go and spend some time living in a Krishna conscious center. In that way you can be very regulated in hearing and chanting and you can be properly engaged in Krishna conscious activities. The guidance of senior devotees makes it very easy for us to become Krishna conscious.
Krishna consciousness is within all of us, but we have to awaken our Krishna consciousness through hearing. So regular hearing is very important. Regular hearing means make use of the internet to listen to different speakers talking and also taking time ourselves to study Prabhupada's book. Many devotees now are in groups where they take turns to read every day and they will read portions from the Bhagavad Gita or from Srimad Bhagavatam and in this way they read every day, they take the reading together, sharing. The main thing is you have to have that desire that you really want to be fully engaged in Krishna consciousness. When, when we have the strong desire, then Krishna from the heart, he will direct us what we have to do. Okay. Yeah. The morning program is very important for all devotees. If you get a good start to the day, then Krishna consciousness becomes so much easier. At any time in the day it is beneficial, but it's particularly beneficial in the morning. So that's why devotees like to try to wake up early in the morning and make use of the morning time to do the and to absorb themselves in Krishna conscious activity. to work, you have to do things in the daytime, there's so many distractions in the day. So we try to make use of the early, the early morning period for Krishna consciousness. All right, so is there yes. Thank you. 
uh, yeah, you 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 could you could ask Krishna like that, but that's not really spiritual. Krishna understands everything. He knows our situation, and he knows what we're lacking. We don't have to tell him what you need. And we see there are many devotees, very advanced devotees, and they're, they're not affected by their material circumstances. They may suffer from some disease which is very troublesome, giving them so many problems, making their life so difficult. Or they may have some very uh, serious economic problems, that they're really in poverty and they don't have the basic needs, as you used to mention. But they don't worry about it. We see examples in the scriptures like uh, there was uh, Kolaveka Sridhar, who was really poor man, he had, you know, he, his business was selling bananas, but he didn't have a lot of bananas. And sometimes he would get some money, sometimes he had no money. When Lord Chaitanya invited him that he could ask something from him, and Lord Chaitanya was revealing himself to be the Supreme Lord, and he told Kulaveka Sridhar, what can I give you? Just ask anything you like. I'm ready to fulfill all your desires. So how did Kolobeka Sridhar respond to Lord Chaitanya? He simply said, oh no, I, I'm happy, I have everything I want. But Lord Chaitanya said, but Sridhar, look, look at your cloth. Your cloth is very old and ragged. And I know your house is really broken down, it's a, it's a ramshackle, it's a, just a, a, you know, not a pleasant house at all, it's very poor condition. I know you, you're in great hardship economically, can't, I, can't you take some wealth from me? But Sridhar said, mm, no, whatever I get, whatever income I get, I spend 50% to worship Mother Ganga. I'm happy. Yeah, every one of us, we are suffering or enjoying according to our past activities. So somebody's got great wealth and somebody's got poverty, it, it, it's just, you know, it's just the, the, the nature of the material world. The bird lives in the tree and the king lives in the palace.
We just accept our situation as the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. That he's put us in these conditions according to our past activities. We just have to go on with our devotional service and one day we'll go back to Godhead. We see also in Lord Krishna Leela, there's a Sudama Brahman. Sudama also was very, very, very poor. He, and he, and he had a wife, and he had no money, and he didn't want to go and beg. He wouldn't beg. He refused to beg. Now he was a brahmana, he had a right to go and beg, but he wouldn't do it. And he even went to see Lord Krishna and he never asked for anything. But Krishna gave him everything. So very soon he went back to God. So we just have to accept our situation. There was another man, there was a leper, Vasudev, he had leprosy in his body. Now leprosy is a very terrible disease and it's contagious. You know, somebody gets a leprosy, people keep away from them, they, you know, and they're put away, they, they, nobody wants to be near them. So this, this one man, he was a brahmana and his name was Vasudev and he had leprosy and he had worms eating the flesh in his body. And sometimes some of the worms which were eating the flesh in his body, they would fall out from his body. And when they would fall out, he would pick them up and put them back into the into the region of his body where they were eating the flesh. So Lord Chaitanya came there and Lord Chaitanya uh, cured the leprosy, he embraced the brahmana. And the brahmana's body became rejuvenated and became very healthy and strong. And the brahmana was worried. He said to Lord Chaitanya, he said, he said, now I may want to enjoy material life. He said, when I was sick, when I had my leprosy, I, I know at that time I had no opportunity to enjoy material life. But now you've made my body healthy, I may want to be, th I may think about sense gratification. So we should think also our situation which we're in, 
that this situation is given to us by the grace of the Lord, that it's, in some ways it's a blessing that Krishna protects us from sense gratification. If you had more opulent, if you had more wealth and so on, then you may not be Krishna conscious, but the, the situation which you're in is Krishna's arrangement to keep you Krishna conscious. So you can pray to Krishna for, for to help you to improve your economic situation or your general situation of living, but that is not actually pure devotion. Another question? Yes, why, why impersonalism is talked about so much? Because generally when people think of spirituality, that's what they think about. They think it's impersonal, that, that the spiritual path is leading to impersonalism. People don't have really much knowledge about the, the personal aspect of spiritual life. It's much easier for people to think about impersonalism than to think about the personal aspect. Now, the thought of becoming one with the Supreme is very attractive to people that, oh yeah, I want to become God. Yo, oh, I, I can become God, yes, this is what I want, I've always wanted to become God, let me, let me try and become God. This is, this is what inspires people towards uh, the path of renunciation. First of all, they try to be become God in the material world. They try to conquer and enjoy and exploit everything in the material world. And when they fail, when they're not, when they see they're not being, they're not getting a lot of success in becoming God in the material world, then they think about becoming God in the spiritual aspect. They think about becoming one with the Supreme, about impersonal liberation.
So be, because these two, uh, the, because this philosophy is so it's spread everywhere, it's so prominent, therefore we have to preach Krishna consciousness, we have to preach the message of Lord Chaitanya. And we see Prabhupada's uh, Pranam Mantra, the second Pranam Mantra, Nirvasesha Shunyavadi Paschachade Satarine, preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya to deliver the Western world from impersonalism and voidism. Of course, but the impersonalism and voidum is not only in the Western countries, it's also all, all over the East as well. It's very prominent in Eastern countries. And Prabhupada, however, began his preaching in the West because a, a bit easier to get people interested in the Eastern countries very difficult to get people interested in personal philosophy. Yes. So, Trying to awaken people to Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada, just like Lord Chaitanya, when Lord Chaitanya was propagating the holy name, he went to South India because he found people more receptive there to the chanting of the holy name than they were in his own Bengal. So generally, somebody who is trying to distribute or preach Krishna consciousness, they will pre they will select the most the, the field where the, the ground is the most fertile, where they can get the best response. So Srila Prabhupada chose to go to America. Well, he didn't know if he would get a good response or not, but he thought, let me try, because he wasn't getting much response in India. Countries in the East, like India and China and Japan and these kind of places, is all full of impersonalism and voidism. No personal philosophies. So sometimes where we're presenting our philosophy, people think we must be Christian because they think Christianity is the only personal philosophy. Christianity, personal, they have a God, personal God, so in the same way they think if we have a personal God we must also be Christians and this way they misunderstand the whole Krishna conscious movement. Of course our movement comes from the Vedic culture which is much older than Christianity.
and even Lord Chaitanya, he had a difficult time because uh, people were not accustomed to the personal aspect. Everywhere he was preaching to impersonalists and voiders. When he went to Jagannath Puri, the, the temple was in the charge of a, devote, a person called Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who was a big Mayavadi, he was a big logician. And Lord Chaitanya made him a devotee. So, we can see how widespread, how easy, it, how big the, the impersonal philosophy is, how it's spread everywhere. And so many people are infected by this contamination of the impersonal philosophy. And we have to preach Lord Chaitanya's mission. <laughs> And we, we saw also when Prabhupada began his preaching in America, he was preaching and he had some devotees and Prabhupada was talking about surrender to Krishna and one of the devotees stood up and began to preach impersonalism. So Prabhupada got so angry, he got so upset, you know, that he'd been come, he'd come all the way there to America to preach this personal philosophy and this American devo so-called devotee gets up and starts to preach impersonalism. Prabhupada had to smash him and crack him and tell him this is all bogus nonsense. So therefore Rupa Goswami is arguing and presenting so much evidence to support the personal philosophy and to defeat this impersonalism. It is said Lord Chaitanya took some elements from each of the different four sampradayas. So one of the things which he took from the Madhva Sampradaya was the complete defeat of the impersonal philosophy. This in, the impersonal concepts are sometimes very deeply hidden in our heart and we're not even aware of it. So we have to hear these different references, we have to, it has to be made uh, apparent to us how liberation is not the goal, that, that there's something much more higher than liberation, there's much greater pleasure than liberation. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. All right. Is there another question? Yes, there is a question from chat. Yes, the природа души служить и вкус душа получает только от служения, то какое счастье с этим вкусом? Well, the, the, the impersonalist, I said, they don't get real taste, but they get free from material suffering. That is the, object, the thinking of the impersonalist, to get out of the material world, to get free of the suffering of the material modes of nature, the free, to get free of the miseries of material life. And coming to that platform of impersonal oneness, one feels, you know, a great relief. Oh, no more misery. Oh, the, it, and that relief is like a form of pleasure. Just like when we come to India, in the summertime it's very hot very humid and hot and it can be very trying, very difficult and we feel so much the, you know, the effect of the heat and, but then finally when you go to a cool place, you think, oh, this is relief, that this is enjoyment. Well, of, co of course, it's, it's not really enjoyment, but because there's, there's not the same heat, we're thinking that no suffering, no suffering, we're thinking, I'm enjoying. So this is the taste, that's what the impersonalists are, are what gives them the impetus for their uh, search for relief. They feel some, you know, sense of unity, oneness, becoming one with the Brahman, seeing everybody equally. And thinking that we've become God, that is in self, that is, the, you know, the, if, if you think, oh, I'm God, I'm, I'm so wonderful, I'm the Supreme. <laughs> I'm, I'm now, I'm the one, I'm the, that one, that one supreme, that, I'm the, the, the greatest, I'm, I'm the one above everyone. So there's some pleasure in that, that kind of consciousness. And we see big Mayavadis, how they, 
how they celebrate, the, how they dress up. They'll dress up like Krishna and they'll have a chariot and they'll get on a chariot and they'll address their disciples and say, you see, I've become, I've achieved this liberation, I've come to this platform, I am that person from which everything comes. And in this way, everybody's worshipping them and they, they feel pleasure. Okay, yeah. This is the happiness of the impersonalist. Any other question there? Uh, Prabhu, uh, Prabhupada would sometimes quote Chanakya Pandit, uh, a moralist of India, and he had said that three things cannot be neglected. He said, first of all, fire. If there's some fire, you have to take it, pay attention, because fire can spread and can you know, burn everything. So you have to immediately take care of a fire. The second thing is debt, that if we have debt, then we want to take care of the debt because debts can always bring us a lot of trouble if we don't pay off the debts. If we have some debt to people, then it brings it, it, it can be a problem. So it's good to take care of debts at once. And the other thing is disease. That if we have a disease and we don't treat it, then that disease can spread and it can, it can just take away all of our strength and all of our ability and it, it, we can die. So it's important if you have some disease, some sickness, you have to pay attention to it, you have to take care of it and try to correct it. And we have to be very determined to try to continue some form of devotional service, even in our sick condition.
we may not be able to chant when we're sick, we may not be able to do a lot of preaching, but we can always hear. And sometimes also, of course, when we're sick we may need more rest, so you have to recognize the need of the body, what's required. But sometimes taking more rest will help us to overcome the sickness. One devotee I know who contacted this COVID-19 disease Doctors told him, they said, don't do anything. They said, just rest because you need all your strength to overcome this disease. Okay, does that help? Who has to uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Who is that? Who is asking the question? Uh, this is uh, Mother Elena. Mm -hmm. Are you sick? Elena, are you sick? Yes, yes, uh, yes. What, what's your problem? Any other question? <laughs> I don't know. They may be personal, they may not. I don't know who's speaking. I don't know the content of all their point, about the one, how they're speaking about it. Yes. Well, well, they they may not be impersonal lectures, and they may not be personal. You know, I don't I don't know. They may just simply be speaking about the topic of their subject, and it may not be personal. It may not be in, doesn't have to be impersonal. It could just simply be they're presenting the topic in a manner to try to cultivate people's interest in the particular aspect of behavior. Generally, we do like to hear quotes, quotations from the scriptures, and we like to hear the name Krishna. 
Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, when he was given articles, he would simply look how many times the name Krishna was said. And if the, the name Krishna was there, then he would say, print it. So it's important for people to hear the holy name of the Lord. But I don't want to condemn people that, oh, they're Mayavadi, oh, they're impersonalist. I don't know. But if you're a devotee, you should want to hear about Krishna. You should be eager to hear about Krishna and Krishna's energies and Krishna's opulence, it's Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's incarnations, Krishna's devotees. Many things. There's so much to talk about Krishna. Why they have to talk other things, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that point. Interesting point. Any other question? Yeah, there's one question on chat. So, uh, what will be uh, uh, the signs of impersonalism? What will be the... The signs. The signs. Uh -huh. Signs of the how we can recognize them. Oh, the signs. The signs of impersonalism. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Well, the sign... The science of impersonalism is that uh, people talk about they go the, about liberation. They give importance to this aspect of becoming one and giving up all identification with the world. They don't speak about Krishna and they don't talk about the eternal nature of devotional service, but they just speak about the oneness and the glory of impersonal, of merging. And they will stress literatures which glorify the impersonal path. Just like Advaita Acharya, when he wanted to make Lord Chaitanya angry, he began to preach from the book called the Yoga Vashishta, which talks about impersonalism. So Lord Chaitanya was so upset, Lord Chaitanya came there and beat Advaita Acharya. He was so angry, he threw him on the ground and he began to beat him. And his, his Advaita Acharya's wife came running and said, No, no, you'll kill my husband. So imper the impersonalist philosophy is glorified in some literatures, and so it's openly impersonalism.
I remember there was one person, uh, they had taken impersonal sections from Prabhupada's books and they were using this to preach and they were glorifying impersonalism. And it was all based on Prabhupada's books. They just selected certain quotes out of Prabhupada's books where they talk about liberation and the glory of the oneness of Brahman. So some people, you know, they're, they're, some people even they come to Krishna consciousness, they bring their impersonal concepts with them and they use it, they use Prabhupada's books to preach impersonalism. So the, the sign of the imper of impersonal philosophy is they're stressing the impersonal Brahman, the oneness, the, the, this desire to become one with the Supreme. And sometimes, you know, they even preach about doing devotional service with the idea to get impersonal liberation. So they, they, they think that the devotional service is just a means to getting the liberation to come to the oneness with the Lord. And when you get that oneness, then you give up devotional service. So it's very difficult to recognize who's an impersonalist and who's a devotee. Impersonalists also worship Radha and Krishna or may worship Jagannath. They also read Bhagavad Gita. They also chant Hare Krishna. But their desire is to want to merge, to enter the oneness. Therefore, our Krishna consciousness movement is training us to recognize where, where is the impersonalism and where is the personalism. Okay, yes, good point. Very nice. Thank you, devotees. Very nice questions. You're very thoughtful. Okay. Are there, is there any other question there? So we'll finish here today. Thank all of the devotees for very, very nice, intelligent questions and I thank you for tolerating me and giving me the opportunity to speak on Krishna Consciousness. Krishna bless you all with spiritual advancement. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Or Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Okay. Hare Krishna.
Thank you, Tadhyayana. Thank you, Hare Krishna.